something new about all of that. For the best, we are back to the Dante Alighieri or the Machiavel time of the rise of empires, and for the worst, and for the worst, to the what the Americans call today, it's a big debate in America, the trap of Thucydides with a shock between uh, Athens and, and Sparta. This is no new at all. What is new is that if you list these empires, there is two missing, two other empires which are missing in the list, American empire and European empire. And this is new. American empire is clearly declining with two dark dates. Number one, when President Barack Obama took the risk of drawing a line, a red line, in front of Syria, Bashar al-Assad, and did not manage to make it respect. And number two, when President Trump drew a line in front of dictator uh, Kim Il-jong and did not manage to make it respect by any ways. So you have an empire, the American empire, which for these two reasons, and without any partisanship bias, partisan bias, is clearly drop in the process of being dropped out the game of empires. Europe, the same. The dream of Dante Alighieri, of a real European empire, might be collapsing in front of our eyes. Look at what is happening with Greece, serving as a head of bridge for Chinese interests. Look at what is happening with Poland in so many regards, the heart, the beating heart of Europe, who is defying EU on regards of a uh, principle of uh, state of, um, of, of law, principle of law and of uh, rights. And look what is happening with UK, with Great Britain, with the Brexit. If there is one beating heart of Europe since the speech of Churchill in Zurich, it was England, they are apparently stepping out of EU. So this is probably new, this beginning of a possible collapse of these two empires. Now, what about Ukraine in this landscape? And this is the main point. I was in Kiev exactly four years ago, a little more than four years ago, no, uh, three years and a half ago, on the Maidan, in February and in March. The night before the bloodbath made by the Berkut on Maidan and a few weeks after. I had the privilege and the honor to listen to what the people of the Maidan had to say and to address the people of, of Maidan one time in the name of the French president of this moment. And I heard, as you all did, this so great, so brilliant, so warm appeal for Europe, desire for Europe stemming from the Maidan. Four years later, what is the situation? Economically, Ukraine made huge progress in all regards. Militarily, Ukraine did something nearly impossible. Out of nothing, Ukraine built a real army that since Debaltsevo never retreated. This is a real performance. And morally speaking, spiritually speaking, philosophically speaking, this dream for Europe, in spite of the little help, not to say more, of your European brothers, this dream of Europe did not collapse. It is stronger than ever, more vivid, more vibrant than ever. You held firm, you held strong on this will for Europe. So my point this morning is the following. I believe strongly 
that the one of the only ways, maybe the best one, to react to this decline of the West in the two forms of the decline of America and of the possible collapse of Europe, one of the way to, to solve that, to get out of that, would be to make, to attempt a new, strong step forward in the direction of the embracement of Ukraine by Europe and by Europe by, uh, and of Europe by Ukraine. I believe more than ever that the question of the entry of the beginning of the process of a possible entry of Ukraine in Europe is more urgent than ever. Economically, 45 million of new European citizens, a little more than 10% of the whole of European population, would be great. Strategically, if you just look at a map, a map of Europe, the day after, it was yesterday, the beginning of the big Russian military maneuvers at the border of Lithuania and Poland, the Zapad, 2017. Just looking at a map, you see that Ukraine is, could be, the best shield, the best buffer area, the best uh, strategical depth, the best protection for Europe, if Ukraine had to step in Europe. And more important than economical and strategic uh, issues, morally speaking, when you have a political body which is losing its blood, as we are in Hungary, in Greece, in Great Britain, in my country in a way, in spite of the victory of our brilliant young President Macron. When a, when a body is losing its blood, what is the best, the, is there a better reply than an injection of a fresh, new, vivid blood of a people who is genuinely sincerely willing and wishing for Europe. So as I said in the Maidan four years ago, I would be, I would like to say it nearly in the same terms if I had them in my mind, this engaging of a process of enlargement toward Ukraine is more urgent than ever. Ukraine has a lot to do still for that. Of course, economically speaking, it's not enough. In terms of corruption, I know that a lot has been done, but probably not justice yet. A lot to do on this, in this matter. Morally speaking, there is one huge parameter for the Europe post-World War II, which is the two ghosts, the communist ghost and the Nazi ghost. Europe has been built on the, on the refusal of the memory, of, on the sorrow, on the mourning of communism, the communist crimes and the Nazi crimes. Ukraine has to do a lot more in these regards, especially about the extermination of the Jews, especially about Babi A lot has been done. I was representing my president at Babiyar at the 75th anniversary of the massacre last year. It was a very moving moment, but we are all expecting 2021, the inauguration of the real memorial, what it will be, to what extent it, to what extent will be given to it, and so on. So there is still to do, but at the end of the day, is there more a road to do by Ukraine today than by Turkey 30 years ago when the process of adhesion, when the process of entry was launched? Turkey was much more far away on moral values, on political parameters, and economically than you in Ukraine are. 
This is why I am optimistic, and this is why I do think that the real reply to this rise of old empires and this vanishing of the West empires, the remedy to that can be the engaging of a process with Ukraine. That's why I say a few weeks ago, the process of entry of Turkey, as you know, has been denounced for what it is, which is a mockery, which is a farce, which is a comedy. So I would like to use this stage today to say bye-bye Turkey, welcome Ukraine, alas, bye-bye UK, welcome Ukraine. This is my word today. Thank you. Thank you, Bernard, and how fitting that you're handing back to a Brit. I'm waving, but yeah, no, I'm, I'm, I wish I weren't, believe me, I wish I weren't. Uh, Bernard, thank you very much. Uh, combining big ideas, a sense of history, thank you so much for that. Let's move straight on to our second uh, take on where the world is now. Uh, from a, not a straightforward political perspective, this time from one of the world's most influential leading economists. Paul Krugman is a winner of the Nobel Prize in Economics. He's uh, an op-ed writer for the New York Times who is a must-read, I think, for many of us in this room. He's a guy who has looked so closely at the way capitalism has worked, particularly in the years since the financial crash, his take on what is happening in Europe, not least, has been absolutely fascinating and I think a real antidote to some of the government policies we've seen uh, in Europe over that period. So I'll stop talking and just let you enjoy the views of Paul Krugman. Paul, welcome to the stage. All right. Um, yeah. Uh, so I'm, I'm going to stay with the economics because uh, there are there's so much to talk about, but I don't think I, I should wander afield. Um, when I saw the topic for this session, you know, the, the topic of the conference, uh, you know, is this a new world? Um, I actually immediately thought about two statements that seem relevant. Uh, one of them is something I said, although I, I stole it from somebody, but I don't know who. Uh, but in early 2009, I, I wrote, uh, um, this is not your father's recession. It's your grandfather's recession. Um, and somewhat relatedly, a little bit afterwards, uh, the economist Mark Toma, uh, influential blogger, um, ha attending a conference on new economic thinking, said, you know, uh, new economic thinking mostly seems to involve reading old books. Um, those two things together, are we in a new world? Uh, actually, no. I mean, obviously, there's always things that are new. What we are in, is, in, in terms of economics is a world that is different from the recent past. It does not look very much like the, um, the world most you know, people of influence grew up in uh, or came of, of, of intellectual and political age in. It does not look like the 1970s or the 1980s, but it does look a lot like things we've been through before. Uh, we are in a, uh, uh, we, we found ourselves in a financial crisis that uh, had clear echoes of the 1930s and for that matter of, of many financial crises in, in the more distant past, uh, we found ourselves in a post-crisis environment that definitely had strong echoes of the 1930s. Um, and the, we, we're not at all in the kind of dramatically, you know, old rules no longer apply world that sometimes people like to talk about. It's, it, um, it, we've actually been, in, in my field, we've been living in a golden age for, uh, for economic historians. It turns out that the, the people who've had the best insights not into you know, what happened in the past, but how are things going to play out now? What, what policies will work, what will not? What is the, how should we think about what's going to happen? Uh, have been the people who studied economic history, people who, who didn't just you know, remember what was going on when they were in graduate school, but paid attention to what was going on in, in earlier generations. So let me talk a little bit about all of that. And actually, maybe a, a way to start is to talk about um, the, the future that didn't happen. Uh, if you go back 10 years and you ask what were people imagining 
was going to be happening over the next 10 years, over the next 20 years. Um, circa 2007, what, what was the vision that, that was popular at least? Uh, what was the vision in best-selling books and, uh, and, and uh, you know, TV shows and so on? And it was a, it was a very much a, a vision of a world where old rules no longer applied. It was a world of uh, rampant globalization. Uh, the, 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 the world was going to be utterly changed. Uh, uh, boundaries were disappearing. Everything, the, the world was flat, uh, which is actually a very good book, but, but the premise that, that uh, that uh, globalization is total and, and the world changes utterly is not true. Um, and also one where modern you know, information technology, the internet, was going to transform everything. And it was all going to be about these epical, unprecedented changes. Um, then what actually happened? Well, first we had the, the global financial crisis. And the global financial crisis, although on the surface there were a bunch of new elements, was an amazingly familiar event. I mean, it's true, nobody saw it coming, or more accurately, nobody, you know, there were some people who predicted it, but if you look, every one of those people also pre predicted five other crises that did not happen, so uh, nobody really saw this coming, uh, but that's mostly because we hadn't quite realized the way in which surface changes had obscured um, some very old phenomena. And the reality, once it happened, even, even as it was underway, immediately, anyone who knew their economic history recognized a classic financial panic something that was fundamentally very similar to the, to the bank runs that swept North America and Europe in 1930-31, very similar to the Panic of 1893, very much. Uh, we, we know what this looks like. Uh, financial institutions that borrow short and lend long, um, that, that leverage themselves up and then get caught in, in a downward spiral of, of falling asset prices and, and, um, uh, and uh, chain reaction of loss of confidence. Um, and when that ended, when, when the, the acute phase of the crisis ended, we found ourselves in a depressed economy around, really around the whole uh, world, that with, uh, with very low interest rates, persistent uh, inadequate spending, that again was very familiar, uh, actually very familiar to anyone who had been paying attention to Japan since the 1990s, uh, but also very familiar from the 1930s. And it's not I, I don't think it's, it's well enough recognized um, how well basic macroeconomics informed by history has actually worked. I think there's this widespread impression that, that we've had no idea what was happening and it's been impossible to predict. So nobody saw the acute crisis coming, but once it did happen, uh, we've actually done re remarkably well. People who, who knew their, their past, knew their basic concepts, uh, uh, read those, reread those old books, reread re uh, Irving Fisher and John Maynard Keynes, uh, have had a, a remarkably good track run. They, they predicted the absence of inflation despite uh, massive increases in the, mo in the monetary base. They predicted low interest rates despite large government deficits. They predicted that austerity policies would have severe negative effects on economies that imposed them. Um, coming into the crisis, uh, early phases, uh, a lot of economists uh, who remembered the old stuff had a view about the, the multiplier, what was going to be the effect of government spending or cuts in government spending on activity, and they, they were, you know, uh, based on, on uh, uh, historical experience principles but no recent experience, they thought that the multiplier would be around 1.5. And now that we have all of the experience of European austerity, all of the experience of Greece and, and, uh, and Spain and Portugal and, and so on under our belts, we can get now actually make an estimate. Um, and it looks like it's about 1.5. Uh, we've actually had a remarkable confirmation of what we thought was true. Um, this not, not newness, if you like, of the, of, of the situation um, is, turns out to be a problem for actually coping with the world. Um, I would say that there are two problems with, of, of, of dealing with it that may seem like they're opposed but actually end up working in concert to undermine our effectiveness. Um, one of them is the um, uh, persistent desire to see things as being unprecedented and new, to believe that we, we are in fact in a new world and that you can't learn from, from the lessons of history. Um, the, the desire to see it as uh, uh, utter transformation, uh, nothing, you know, you can't, surely economic theories from 80 years ago can't be, 
providing useful guidance to us now. Surely uh, studying uh, economic events in the 30s or Japan in the 90s can't be a good guide to, uh, to this modern world with, I mean, the Japanese didn't even have the internet in the 1990s. How can they possibly be giving us useful lessons? And yet it turns out that they did. Um, and by the way, study of history tells you that this too is predictable. If you go back to the 1930s, there are a remarkable number of people said that, well, we have you know, it's, it, this modern industrial society, technology is advancing so rapidly. Of course, we have massive technological unemployment and uh, workers no longer have the skills to, uh, to be employed. Uh, you can't just expect to spend more and have them go to work. Then, of course, came a very large fiscal stimulus, otherwise known as World War II, um, and suddenly all of those people turned out to be employable. So uh, the, the, the very uh, uh, stagnation of, of uh, the, the very um, obsession with the new getting in the way of dealing with, with the now uh, is itself something that history tells you to expect. And the other thing which I've, has been really striking to me um, is that uh, if you ask if people with, with actual influence, people in a position to, to actually determine what we do, by and large, um, came of age politically, intellectually, uh, and in other ways during the 1970s. And that means that they have a mindset which is faced on their, is, is conditioned by the relatively recent past. Uh, it's been astonishing to watch people keep on expecting inflation, keep on inf expecting stagnation, uh, stagflation, keep on expecting that, that the problems that we're going to face now are going to be those that you know, prevailed when they were growing up. Uh, when it keeps on not happening, and predictably keeps on not happening, and yet, to this day, it's very, very difficult to get peop uh, people of influence to acknowledge that you know, this is not, we are not facing the economy of Jimmy Carter. We are not facing the, the world that, uh, of the 70s, that we, what we need to worry about is much more the kinds of problems that prevailed in the 1930s, uh, up to and including, by the way, just one step outside economics, the, uh, the, uh, the, the rise of dangerous ideologies that, which uh, have lots of roots, but a persistent economic underperformance is one of the things that makes that, uh, that possible. Um, and meanwhile, um, the, well, the combination, the belief that you can't do anything more, the belief that uh, because of rapid technological change, well, look, I, I actually am, am uh, preparing some, some, uh, some further work on this in the near future, but go back just three or four years ago, um, and you can find a lot of people, a lot of influential people, people uh, in business, people in, in, um, in positions to actually have the direct ear of policymakers, uh, asserting with great confidence that there was no way that the United States could get back down to unemployment of below 5%, because clearly structural changes, problem of, of lack of skills was, you know, it was going to make that impossible. And here we are, 4.3% unemployment, uh, no problems of inflation except that it's too low. Uh, and it turns out that actually, yeah, we're, we're still in the same world. It still works pretty much the same way that, that we uh, thought it would. Um, and that combination of worrying about the problems of 30 years ago, not the problems of 60 years ago or 80 years ago, and of at the same time imagining that we're in a completely different world have acted as a paralysis on policy. Um, I don't have much to say about Ukraine, except to say that uh, it's actually been quite impressive, given the, the nature of the crisis that Ukraine went through in 2014-15, to see the economy stabilize. It's not, it's not a roaring boom, but at least off the bottom, some of the danger signals have really receded. They've gone from red lights to yellow lights in terms of, of budget deficits um, and, and inflation. Um, and what's striking, given the theme of what I've been talking about, is that you know, how did Ukraine do that? It did that pretty much in a familiar way. The Ukrainian turnaround looks a lot, for someone with my background, looks a lot like uh, successful reforms in, in developing countries and, oh, that have happened many, many times. It looks like, like uh, reforms that worked in, in, um, uh, in Latin America, uh, getting away from a commitment to an unsustainable exchange rate, uh, letting a combination of depreciation and, and uh, rebalancing domestically bring you back into sustainable territory. Uh, that's not a, it doesn't solve all your problems. If you want to ask, you know, what, how do we, uh, 
<laughs> how do you achieve really major economic growth? How do you really achieve an economic takeoff? The answer is uh, we don't know, uh, and we never have. So in that sense, things have not changed. Uh, but if we ask, uh, do we know how to at least produce a situation which is not boiling over? We do, we, and, um, and Ukraine has done that. Um, it's always, you always want to be open-minded. Things do change. The world does move on. It certainly moves on on the surface. If you, um, if you expect that it will look exactly the same way as it did, that can be a big mistake. Part of why we didn't see 2008 crisis coming was that people thought that banks were big marble buildings with rows of tellers. And it turns out that functionally they don't have to look like that at all to pose the same risks. Um, but we are, uh, uh, there's a lot of wisdom to be gained from looking at the past. And an excessive focus on the new, on the radical, is fun, it's sexy, but it actually means that you miss the point and you can get the policies totally wrong. Thanks. Paul, stay there for one second, if you would. I've just got one question for you, and it's, I hope, a simple one. The most striking thing to me of late in the way capitalism works, particularly in the United States, is that for the first time, I think it's fair to say in the last hundred years, the ordinary folks, working and middle class folks, are seeing that their living standards have not risen in real terms over a 30 year period yeah. and that they cannot expect their kids to have a better material life than they have had. Is that something that you believe we just have to get used to in the way capitalism is unfolding right now? Or is that uh, a blip and we can go back to expecting growth, greater prosperity, better living standards for our kids than for ourselves? Neither of those, because, look, the, the stagnation of living standards is probably new, although it's not as if we have great uh, uh, data um, if for, for the past. And if, if we go back far enough, probably Britain during the Industrial Revolution was the same thing. You had a, probably about 40 years during which uh, massive economic growth, none of which was shared with workers. Um, but more to the point, the high degree of income inequality that we are experiencing, um, um, we've been there before. Where we are now looks quite a lot like, like uh, the levels of income inequality that we had in the 1920s and 1930s. And we do know how that ended. And it did not happen through the uh, invisible hand of the marketplace. It did not happen automatically. It happened because we had policies that changed it. If you ask where did that middle, certainly for the United States, and I believe it's true for the UK as well, if we ask where did that middle class society that I grew up in come from, it actually happened very fast in 1938, we had a very unequal society. In 1946, with the end of the war, the you know, peace came to a society that had become radically more equal, radically more of a, a society in which everyone participated in the economy. And that was achieved through policies, was achieved through government policies designed to limit inequality, progressive taxation, strong unions. So we know how to do this. Um, if we don't have the political will for it, well, that's but yeah. we also, I think, we don't have the history. I guess that's an interesting message to take away, that government policy really does matter. Yes, makes right. an enormous difference. Okay, Paul, thank you so much. Thanks, Thanks a lot. Uh, and now, ladies and gentlemen, another different perspective. I'm delighted to say that one of the leading artists, I think it's fair to say, of her generation has joined us today. Uh, Marina Abramovic is from Serbia but she is now truly an internationally acclaimed artist. She's won awards and put on amazing exhibitions all over the world. She has this unique creative instinct, which means that she combines visual installation and performance art. Many of you, will, I'm sure, have seen her work in different cities. I saw it, an amazing thing she put on at the Serpentine Gallery in London a few years ago. Uh, so. Marina has come to give us her perspective on what's new, her take on the world today. Marina, the floor just about is yours. And welcome. Hello, yes. Can we put the first image? No, the second one. Second one, the title. How this doesn't work, wait. Second one. In the meantime, I would like to thank uh, Victor Pinchuk Foundation to invite me here 
because I feel I am in the turbulent ocean of politicians and the only one artist. This is not very comfortable, but I try my best to give you my point of view, which is probably very different. If you ever go to New York, you have to really go to the Museum of um, Natural History. And you have to go to the planetarium. And this planetarium is actually for children. But you also come there as all grown-ups. And I went there many times. And it's a very important reason why I'm going there. And I'd like to share this with you. You go there, you sit in very comfortable chairs, an entire sky open. And then they have different programs about dark matter and so on. But this program I suggested you to see, it's about Milky Way. It's about our galaxy. So you look there and you look into these incredible stars and then there is a tiny, tiny little blue planet, but not in the middle of Milky Way, somehow in the outskirts, like Siberia of Milky Way, somewhere far away. We are not even in the center of Milky Way. And then you have this wonderful like, voice of, let's say, Jeff, George Clooney, who say to you, and this is a planet Earth. Wow, we are so tiny, so precious. And any asteroid, any huge other planet can just crash on us every single second and everything what we have that we you know, believe in will stop existing in a minute. I don't believe that this planet will going to even make it as a human beings in the next 100 years if you don't take things seriously. But let's go back from this macroscopic image into microscopic. And I'd like to tell you something about myself and why I'm here. So, I hope this works now. First of all, it was very important to me the title. What I'm going to say here. And I really like this title. And now what? We know how past is. We know how things we've done. We know our mistakes. And, what is, and we only can really relate to present, because it's the only existence we have, and the future that we can project. But future we don't know, because the real thing is here and now. And what we do here and now is only what is important. So why this doesn't work? Okay. Can you, I'm the only one who uses visuals. Come on, kids, give me the next slide. Can you do it visually? I don't work. There's no battery here, by the way. Is this possible? Is this battery here? No, it doesn't work. Ah, this is not on. Okay, so my parents, I come from ex Yugoslavia. My parents was partisan, fighting against the war with the Tito. My mother was major of the army and my, and my uh, father was um, general. Both my parents are national heroes from the Second World War. My mother, this was just age 23, writing reports on the front. This is my father kneeling down next to Tito. But then, you know, everything went wrong. As you know, the things went wrong in my country and being very disturbed too. Wait. Uh, I would start very early as an artist to make the work. And you know, sometimes it's very important to make the work can predict the future. I wanted to get out of the country. I want to go somewhere else. And I started making these works going free in the horizon. I would remove the buildings from the Belgrade. The one thing would happen there that I done this 30 years ago. And in the meantime, Americans bomb us. And the 30 years later, this building really don't exist. So this is just the way how we can actually predict the future. Our artists have the global image. So, which is important with art is big picture. Politicians have to have a big picture, but artists have to have even a bigger picture. Because artists are oxygen in our society. Us have to have different point of view of everything. And we are free. We don't uh, discriminate. We don't belong to anybody. We can do whatever we want. And that's a very important position. This is my father, a liberation of Belgrade. I made a piece when he died. He was a very disappointed man. Oh, God. He was a very disappointed man and... Uh, I hate that. This is image, another? No. And he really didn't believe in what happened to the uh, Yugoslavia, to communism and all this stuff. So I made a war called The Hero, which I just sit on the horse with the white flag. And um, you know, heroes don't have white flag. White flag is surrendering. But I made this piece after my father died because I really wanted to 
learn the hero to surrender to change. So this is how we translate, you know, into art, different things. Okay, next slide. Please just do it yourself. I don't want to touch. Next. Then comes the war, the Balkan war. I was so shame about this war. I was the shame what happened in, in Bosnia and everywhere else. And I was asked to make artwork. Next slide. So what I done, I in Venice Biennale took 2,500 bones and I just cleaned, tried to clean the blood away from them. You know that you can't clean the blood that easily. One is never can clean the blood. But I wanted to create image which to do with the shame of the war. But this also, not just about war, what happened in my country, but I want to create something which is transcendental, that actually this image you can use not in any country, any time, whatever war is. So the art is about not telling just one story, but telling many, many stories. And now I would like to tell you, okay, next slide. I want you to read you something. I can read like this. All right. How we will Balkan make wolf flat? This is a very important story because it's a metaphor for everything else, as artists use metaphors. I like to tell you the story how we in Balkan kill the rats. We have a method to transform the rat into the wolf, to make wolf rat. But before I explain this method, I like you to know some more things about the rats themselves. First of all, Rats consume large quantity of food, sometimes the double weight of their own body. The front teeth are growing permanently. They have to be grinded constantly, otherwise they are facing suffocation. Rats take very well care of their family. They will never kill or eat their own members. They're extremely intelligent. Einstein said once, if, if rat will be only 20 kilo, more weight, he will be ruler of the world. If you put a plate with the food and poison in the front of the hall, the rat will sense it and will not eat it. The method. To catch the rats, you have to fill the holes with the water, leaving only one open. In this way, you can catch 35 to 45 rats. You have to make sure that you only choose the male ones. You put them in the cage and give them only water to drink. After a while, they start getting hungry. The front teeth start growing. And even genetically, they will not kill the same members of their family. Facing suffocation, they are forced to kill the weak one in the cage. And then another weak one, and another weak one, and another weak one, till only one, the strongest, and the more superior rat from all of them are left. Now, the rat catcher continue to give the water to the rat. In this point, the timing is extremely important. His teeth start growing. And when the rat catcher sees that there is less than half an hour left before the suffocation, he opened the cage, take the knife, and take his eyes out of his head, and then let him free. Now, the rat is nervous, outraged, in a panic. He's facing his own death. He run into the rat holes and kill every rat from his own family come his way, till he find the rat that is stronger and more superior than him. This rat kill him. This is the way how we in Balkan make wolf rat. So, this is the story of our story from ex-Yugoslavia. So, as an artist, I see a collective and emotional change happening in the world. The world has accelerated, and humans have become indifferent and numb. Back in the old days, making nuclear treats was a big deal, and the world creates serious panic. Nowadays, especially the last week, Public nuclear treats seems to be part of our daily life. 
and this is confusing and psychologically destructive. Our collective intelligence has gotten accustomed to very real possibility of massive destruction. This puts people in a constant state of fear. And only horrible things can come from fear. And there are only sources of fear, less monumental, very pressing. Our everyday fears. Fear of not being able to pay rent because technology will take job over. Fear that the local factory will move to the other side of the world, taking away our source of income. Fear of terror, which is more unpredictable than ever before. And eventually, fear of the fear itself. Never before have been in more needs of leadership, political, academic, scientific, and cultural. And that is why our gathering here is in Yalta Summit is such a great importance. We are standing on historical crossroads. Our decision will determine the future. And now what? And now what? Can we have some slides, please? One thing that I really like is say that culture, it's not luxury, it's necessity. And Gandhi is the one president that he never spent one drop of blood and changed consciousness of the people in India. If we can have this kind of presidents today, our world will be so different. Thank you. Marina. I actually want a question from you because you're great. I love your hard talks. <laughs> I forgot about that. You want a question yes, from me? Yes, one oh, question. Fantastic. Well, I, I wasn't even ready for that. But if I have a question for you, it's this. You said at the very beginning, as an artist, I feel a little bit uncomfortable in a room full of politicians, thinkers, sort of political people. Do you think politicians have the wider sensitivity, uh, the ability to think in ways that, that go beyond the short term, go beyond the, the political, and actually bring their humanity to the table as politicians? Absolutely not, and very few of them have, very few, and they're the great politicians, and there are many others are not. And this is the very big problem, because the only way to change the world is to change the consciousness of human being, and the only way to change yourself you can change thousands, and that's very difficult because you have to first change yourself. This is why I took the, the, to the example of Gandhi as a really great example of really, he really teach what he'd been doing in his own life. That's a big difference. So how to change consciousness is also to deal with culture, be open to art, be open to large picture. Because it's very, politician I always feel is so narrow, you know, they always having these meetings and talks and, is, and you meet the same people, but you really don't break, you don't think out of the box. That's the big deal. And a, a final one, it's the most crude question in a way, but never mind, I'm gonna ask it. Politicians always say, when you ask them to justify what they do, uh, they always say, look, I'm not in this for myself, I do it because I wanna change the world. I'm in it for public service, serving the public, making the world a better place. Do you think, I mean, I don't know what drives you. I imagine the creative spirit is deep within you and you do it whether it was successful or not. But, but do you think art and artists can change the world? No, I don't think the art and artists can change the world. It will be completely presumptuous. But I really think they can actually uh, show different sensitivity. They can open the world different views. This is why I think the artists Oxygen Society, this is why I think that art is necessary, and this is why I think because art can lift human spirit today. And it's so easy to put human spirit down. It's very difficult to lift it up. Art have tools to do it. And that's a very nice thought to end on. Marina, thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you. Um, thank you. Thank you to all of our three speakers. So I promised you something different, different takes, different perspectives 
on, uh, yeah, here's the, all, the, all of the different sort of thoughts are sort of now lying on the floor. But I want to thank all of our three speakers, and I just want to tell you all that uh, lunch is now going to be served, I believe, as usual, in the big sort of tent over the way. Uh, and I'm going to be hosting a, what I think is going to be a fascinating discussion about where America is today and what global role we can expect from America going forward. So please join me for that discussion over lunch and enjoy your lunch as well. Bon appétit, everybody. <laughs>